1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast is proudly sponsored by The Terrace, the home of retro and fan culture sports merchandising. Check out their range of Forest merch by visiting theterracestore.com or visit them on social media. Hello there and yuletide greetings to Forest fans all over the world. This is 1865 and Nottingham Forest podcast and I'm your host, Rich Ferraro. Coming up in today's show, we're going to be talking about Steve Cooper and what's the secret to his success. We're going to be talking about transfers before the January window comes around. We'll hear from our friend Jeremy Davis with his monthly sketch. And we will also be talking about the possibility of how COVID will affect the next few weeks of football. In the meantime, I would like to introduce today's panel. So, sleigh bells ring. Are you listening, Stephen Topless? Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. In the arms of the girl he loves, it's Tom Newton. Season greeting one and all. And you're a bum, you're a punk. Hello, Baz. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) (laughs) You stopped that at the right point then. (laughs) I wasn't going to say any more. Um, so let's get straight into it. At the time of recording, uh, we have just beaten Hull, and this has left Forest at seventh in the table, uh, just one point outside the playoff zone. And let's just go straight into it. Tom, if you'd asked any Forest fans back in September, do you think we'll be on the verge of the playoffs? What do you think the answer would have been? Um, there would have been laughs all around. They really would because we basically um the club and everybody was so to speak on their arse, really. And um the football like I said on previous podcasts and I pro- probably sound like a broken record, but under uh, Chris Hutton, it was terrible. It was really like a chore to watch Forest. Since Steve Cooper's come in, it's been chalk and cheese, hasn't it, of the performances and the results. And he's been brilliant since he walked through the door and long may it continue. And just on that theme there, Baz, if we talk about uh, where Forrest want to be, as fans, most seasons, at the start of the season, Forrest fans will say, Ashley, I'd be content with challenging for the playoffs. So, I mean, do you think actually we have a realistic hope of that for this season? Well, I'd have said at the beginning of the season, top half of the table would be a, a fantastic result for us. Um, it's one of those things, though, when you're this close to it, then, yeah, you really want it. It's like, especially when, as you're saying, it's like a point off and, and, you, and you're that close and you think there's always that one team right at the, that makes a little run for it right at the end. And why can't that be us? I, I don't think we're anywhere near ready for it. I don't think that's actually going to happen. But. But when you're that close, it's, it's yeah, you, you want it to happen. Hmm. And Stephen, I, I mean, obviously, Tom's alluded to the Chris Hutton era, and you know, we've we've gone over that quite a lot in the past, and the contrast between what we had then and and what we've got now. I mean, for me, yes, results are good. We had that spell where we were drawing rather than winning, but it's worth remembering that. Cooper's just got exactly the same squad as as Hewton had at the time that he left the managerial hot seat. Absolutely. And I think it shows the incredible impact that Steve Cooper has made at Forest and the and simply good management. He's taken on a group of players who, let's face it, in the first seven games of the season, looks like relegation fodder. We could not get a performance going, we couldn't get a result, goals were drying up, we were conceding too many, everything was just going wrong. And Cooper came in and quickly made an impact and he's carried that impact on to a point now where we've only lost one in nine, I think some one defeat in 16, 17 games, to go from the bottom of the table to, as it stands a point off the playoffs before Christmas is a tremendous achievement. And it's, it's, it's simply down to, to good management, the right tactics to get the best out of these players, giving the players the confidence to, to go out, 
take the games to the opposition and give them that belief that they can go and win games. And the transformation has been incredible, really. And to do this in such a short space of time just makes me excited now for what can happen from January and beyond. And with hopefully his own additions coming in in January, there's every chance we can build on this great start and who knows, make a, a proper push for the playoffs. OK, and we'll come on to uh, onto the squad in a little while. But Tom, I'm just going to ask you the same question I've just asked Baz and Stephen, which is, um, actually, I've just looked at the table and realised that we're halfway through our matches. So is playoffs or even better? Are, the, are those realistic prospects under Steve Cooper as the manager? Um, I just think, well, with recent when we was last in the playoffs under like um, Billy Davis, um, I think it was like that was more of the expectation. And since Cooper's come in, it's just been a match of just enjoy it um, and stay and like we're on like a really good journey as he puts it. And just there's no expectation, there's no pressure, and um, because where we was started the season to now, like says it's um, like well, a night and day. Um, just enjoy it, um, and basically next month add to the squad just to give us that bit more depth going um, in the final months of the season and um, see where we are come May then if we don't ultimately uh, get into the playoffs or we get into the playoffs and and lose or whatever, just build in the summer and just build bit by bit and in a couple of years we may be like like a, um, in recent years it went like a Norwich where we can actually be at the top half of the table and actually have a, a squad what we can believe in and it's been built from say this season and see where it goes but this season I, I've got no expectations I don't we're miles away from relegation uh, zone and I just think just enjoy it and don't put too much pressure on and see what Steve Cooper can do um, with the players he's got now and hopefully a few more additions uh, next month Thank you, Doug. Now, I'll come back to that uh, in a minute, uh, you know, what the Cooper effect is, because, Baz, I know you alluded to something in our match report after Hull, and I'd like to come back to that in just a second. Um, but I was reviewing, well, someone tagged me into uh, a, a Twitter thread, and uh, it reminded me that back in September, I'd said, along with a few other Forest fans, I'm not sure about Cooper, not convinced about the style of football. So, yeah, he got results at Swansea, but uh, do we really want another defensive manager? And, um, and, and so, actually, at the time, if you remember, back in September, I think we, uh, when we had a podcast, we did say Nick Miller actually came on and said, I was expecting Chris Wilder to be the manager. So in a word, and I'm going to go around all of you and then we'll continue the discussion. But in a word, back in September, would you have chosen Wilder or Cooper? Baz? Wilder. Stephen? Cooper. Tom? Cooper. That's that's too all then, because clearly I wasn't going for Cooper at the time. Um, Now, I'm not saying that Chris Wilder's not a a good manager, because he clearly is, and he's already turning things around at Borough in a very effective way. Um, But I think it's worth reminding him that Jed Spence is rubbish. Um, But, Baz, let's talk about the Cooper effect, because Stephen's talked about tactics, uh, Tom's talked about positivity. You want to talk about some of the psychology, don't you? Well, I mean, actually, there's something else I wanted to get to first, which is, um, so the, the Swansea fans going on about how he was a defensive manager and, and, and all this sort of thing. I've recently started playing the latest version of um, Football Manager, what used to be Championship Manager, and it mentions XG all the way through it. Every every game report afterwards, it tells you about your XG and your opponent's XG. So I thought, right, I don't really know enough about XG, so I'm going to read up on it. And I know lots of people don't like the data analysis and stuff, but I don't really like the data analysis. But I thought, let's find out what this thing is. And XG basically is something like, if you, the ball's in this position, what on average would people score from it? So if you get a penalty, apparently the XG is 0.76, which means 76% of penalties are scored. And if you then get eight out of 10 penalties, then you're you're beating the XG. And if you get seven out of 10 penalties, you're, you're worse than the XG. So out of interest, I just thought, uh, let's look at what Forrest's XG has been this season. And under Hewton, our XG4 was very, very low. And our XG against was very, very high. 
Then when Steve Cooper came in, our XG4 was incredibly high, but our XG against was incredibly high. And I can remember one of these monthly ones, we were talking about, well, it'd be nice. It's nice that we're scoring all these goals, but it'd be nice to keep a clean sheet. And then straight after that, Steve Cooper was saying the same sort of thing about scoring the first goal in a game. And then immediately after that, our XG4 and our XG against both dropped right down. And that, even though he doesn't talk about it in his interviews, that defensive mindedness is obviously a very, very important thing to how he sets up. And he wanted to get us playing with some belief to start with. And then once we got that belief about going forwards, then he was building and putting the putting the foundations back in place. And you could see that yesterday against Hull, where for the last 20 minutes, we played with a back five, full on back five, not not a, not a three, four, three. It was a back five. And we were under the cosh and we were resilient. And and that's a, a defensive performance that Chris Hewton would have been proud of. Mm. And you could say the same against Reading as well, of course, because they brought in Andy Carroll. So immediately, as soon as they could, yeah, they conceded when Carroll came on. But that's because Cooper couldn't get Figueredo on to do yeah. the kind of aerial work, which is exactly what he did against Hull, isn't it? Now, mm-hmm. the other thing, um, and I will come to the rest of you in just a second, but the other thing that's crucial there is, and again, you've alluded to in the past, Cooper has this, he knows how to play the crowd, doesn't he? He knows what he's saying before, <laughs> during and after matches. Yeah, and um, I, was, I was, again, I was talking to the bloke next to me and saying, yeah, no one since Billy Davis has done this. That, that whole bit about the, the, the fist bump before and after the, the game and, and what he says in, 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 the, in the interviews and, and what he's, he obviously must be doing that with the players as well. And I, I think a lot of it, Certainly, um, we were talking before this, before the recording about Alex Ferguson. Certainly back in those days, yeah, the hairdryer treatment might have been what players needed. But I think today that they want the arm around them and they want them to, to feel like they're, they're something that they can do these things. They, they need to believe in themselves. And I think that's what Cooper's been. That's what he does in the interviews. That's what he does with his fist pump. And I'm sure that's what he's doing with the players as well. Tom, you're probably out of all of us, the one who gets the most matches. Does the Cooper effect get you fired up? Do you do you cheer wildly when you see him doing the fist pumps? Do you have a smile on your face when you hear his pre-match presses? Um, I, I do, because I'm going to football matches now, um, knowing that I'm going to enjoy it. Um, under Chris Hewton, I wasn't enjoying going to football matches because I just think it's going to be a real... Um, dog's dinner of of an affair Um, but now it's just brilliant to watch um, playing with um, intensity Um, you know we're going to go down fighting even if we don't win a football match it's still going to be a decent game of football and you can leave that um, game and say yeah we've we played well there, but not necessarily got what we deserved or whatever so um, yeah how they're playing at the moment it's what I spend my money on because I want to be I know Sometimes you're not always entertained, but under um, Steve Cooper, I just think it's really nice to actually go to a football match knowing that I'm going to enjoy it and get my money's worth. OK, and, and, and Stephen, on a, on a similar topic there, that thing about enjoyment and, yeah, I said we don't want to talk too much about Hewton, but uh, there's that idea, and I was saying to, uh, to uh, the good lady yesterday when we were listening into the match and saying, this team... Under Cooper, there's never been a match where they've given up at any point. And under Hewton, you kind of feel if we'd gone 1-0 down just before half-time, then that was game over. Do you agree with me on that? Definitely. There was, uh, under under Hewton, it, it's almost as if the players became resigned to losing games. And if they fell behind, they didn't have the confidence in themselves to try and turn it around and you know, you, you'd end up with a meek final few moments of the game where it peters out and and Forrest labour to another defeat. And there, was, there, there wasn't the inspiration in there to... Certainly, for, it didn't seem like there was that, that spark and that inspiration to say, whatever happens in a game, you've got the ability to turn it around and you can get back on the front foot and try and get a goal to equalise or to win a game late on and... The transformation under Cooper on that front has been huge, and it comes back to mentality. I think having having that that right mentality in the dressing room, that confidence instilled in the players, so that they know 
whatever happens in a game, they can respond to it and the manager can respond to it. And that translates into late goals and this, this notion of never giving up. And it makes for more entertaining football. You see it under Chris Hewton, fans would be leaving 10, 15 minutes before the final whistle if Forrest were behind because they never felt confidence that Forrest would turn it around. Whereas now under Cooper, you want to stay right until the very end because you know this team is capable of of fighting back and getting something from every game. And I think a case in point actually is Fulham where scoreline wise we got battered, but actually they still kept playing right until the final whistle. You didn't see that many people leaving before the end. Tom, you wanted to jump in there. Um, yeah, like I said, under Hooton, you got like player after I was like playing 40 yards um, away from goal and you got like <clears throat> players like Joe Lolly who's mentioned in the past that they were playing more defensive when we know we're, no, we're we were um, attacking players. So as fans watching that, we know we've got no chance of winning football matches. And, and if the play, if we're thinking that, the players are thinking that. And then it's just going to be a dull atmosphere inside the stadium. And since Steve Cooper's come in, um, everybody's um, got more confidence because we know we're going to be a bit more attacking and play further up the field. Um, but I don't want to keep going on about it. But um, yeah, the huge football is terrible, to be honest. And Baz, uh, just, you know, with that idea about players knowing their job, so under Hewton, you wanted them to do the defensive work first. Under Cooper, it's a little bit more progressive. So as you've mentioned a few times before, if you look at the really kind of innovative coaches and, and the classic example, OK, Leeds are having a terrible time at the moment, but they've only got about four fit players. Um, but Bielsa has this idea whereby every player knows his job and they know their job to the point whereby you can have a player like Stuart Dallas who can play in five different positions in one match and always be like a seven out of ten in all of those positions. You look at Pep and the way that he does it. He had John Stones playing at right back the other night and you would never have known that he was playing out of position. So that idea about players knowing their jobs, that's a crucial part of modern coaching, isn't it? Well, yeah, so the... the... I was reading about Rangnick, who the guy who's now at Manchester United, and what he does on the training field is he gives them like four seconds when they receive the ball to then try and score. And the idea of it is to make it instinctive. So it's not even that they think about what they need to do next. It's just right. They react because then when they're under pressure in a game, they'll do it straight away. The other thing I was reading about a reading book about, which is a couple of years old now, and I've just finished the, 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 chapter on Graham Potter but it was before he went to Brighton about what he did in Sweden and what he did there was he was talking about how it's really important to have a culture around the players so they all fit together and belong together and I noticed that one of the first things in one of the first interviews that Steve Cooper gave gave he was talking about the identity of Forrest and and how he wanted the team to have an identity and he, he keeps coming back to that all the time he keeps on talking about patterns of play and knowing what to do at certain times and, and and ingraining it in them and I think that's one of the things that he's doing is he's building this identity this cohesion so the team works as an actual team and I think probably yeah we were we Certainly the interviews that have happened post Hewton suggest that we weren't a team before we were a load of people sort of going their own way. Stephen, on that is what Baz says, is that basically the secret to Cooper's success is uh, even though he's working with the same players, that's that's the secret to it. It's to do with getting the players to work together as opposed to being a bunch of individuals, each with their own jobs to do. Yeah, and you go and look back again at some of the, the play under Chris Hewton, it was very individualistic, relying on one player to make a moment of magic happen, whether that was knockout or lolly or even grabbing, just trying to pick the ball up and do something with it. Sammy Amiobi. Sammy Amiobi, another another one. Um, yes, it can work. Of course it can work, because it, it, it has for Chris Hewton in the past. But I, I, the key, and you're seeing it with Cooper now, this team mentality, Everybody's everybody's on the same page. Everybody believes in what, the, the manager wants them to do and everybody's more involved. And uh, you're seeing that with the way that Forrest play, with the way that everybody brings it, everybody else into play. The wing-backs get forward, the midfielders, they work hard and they, they cover so much ground for the team. And all of these areas 
it's like they're all joined up again. So your defence, your midfield attack, it it's all linked together again. It, it makes for a cohesive team and cohesive performances. And I think that translates into results and general confidence in in your ability. And it's it, the mental and the, the tactical side there, it almost feeds into one another and feeds off each other. And it, it's just been so impressive the way that Cooper's instilled this so quickly after taking charge. Well, Tom, why do you think... I heard you say something interesting in one of the recent match reports about how um, fans can sometimes forget where they've come from. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned about Brighton fans who are grumbling about the fact that Brighton hadn't scored many goals, et cetera, et cetera. Why do you think Swansea fans are a little bit down on Cooper and say he's defensive and negative? Was that just down to him having to make the best with the squad that he had? Um, I think that can probably have been spoiled that they were in the Premier League under, like, Brendan Rodgers, Loudrop, um, et cetera. And so I probably think that they, because of how they play football, a bit like a, a Brentford um, situation where well, we play good football, so we should be in the Premier League. And they had these like technical attacking players. Then Steve Cooper's come in and had um, just the players to work with, and they probably thinking, well, this football is boring, and that's why they probably never truly did to the way he does things. But he's come in here, and I mean, yeah, he has obviously made us stronger at the back, but we're playing in more an attacking sense, and um, hence why we're winning football matches at the moment. So I think it's just a matter of like what fans actually feel their club should be at a certain moment in time. But going back to identities, I think it. I think while the, our fan base is really excited about it, because we haven't had an a identity for God knows how long, so to actually see there's a purpose of how we're playing football at the moment, you can see it going somewhere rather than just having a manager who's like coming and you know he's not going to last. But Cooper, because he's got this like um, track record of um, coaching and developing younger players, and we've got like a, an outstanding academy from the work what um, Gary Brazil and his staff do. It seems to be like a, um, a method in where we're going as a football club, and that hasn't happened for a long time. Stephen, and on that, just going back to the the question earlier about Wilder over Cooper, the reason I preferred Cooper over Wilder was because. Wilder came across as more of a short-term fix rather than somebody who could build something. Uh, not taking away the achievements from uh, from Sh- from Northampton, Sheffield United in particular, taking them into the Premier League. But you look at the way that Sheffield United fell off once they were in the Premier League and they'd had that one good season. And you could argue they're still on a downward spiral now, the way that they've dropped and they've struggled to get out of the bottom half this season of the championship. Whereas I always felt that Cooper was a manager who can get those results in the short term, but also has that long-term strategy and that willingness to build something at a club, which if we do get into the Premier League, which is obviously something we'd all want to see Forrest achieve, it would be more sustainable under Cooper than I think it would have been under Wilder. Interesting. Baz? Well, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's this idea of identity and culture and stuff like that. I think every club does have a sort of culture around it. And I mean, I'm quite happy to admit that, yeah, I was completely wrong about Wilder. Um, Cooper's a much, much better fit. And part of the reason for that probably is Swansea was a club that did have a culture, a very strong identity and how it wanted to play. They, they, their, their directors had put that thing in place with them. Um, with Martinez and Brendan Rodgers and all that, that's like six second louder up that succession plan. So even when the manager changed, the style stayed pretty much the same. So maybe Cooper was just enough of a diversion from that style to cause a disconnect. We've not had an identity or a culture for quite a long time. So Cooper coming in and doing something that actually is about developing young players and bombing forwards, that fits really, really well with us. And Wilder, is obviously a really, really good fit for Sheffield United because of his because of his background. And actually, one of the big points against him is Sheffield United's culture is very, very different to our culture. So maybe him coming in would have been a complete mistake, same way as, I don't know, bringing in Joe Kinnear was a mistake or whatever. It's just that, that the, the ethos and the, the, the underlying stuff underneath it is just different and Forrest need a particular way because that's that's the kind of club we are. And Cooper's managed to 
when he says he's falling in love with the club, I think that that's actually a representation that the two of us are actually quite a good fit in our cultures. And uh, before I come to Tom, I'd just like to point out in our WhatsApp group, Stephen did uh, type in last last week, must not get too attached to the manager, must not get too attached to the manager, because it's it's hard not to at the moment, isn't it? Anyway, Tom, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, just um, regarding what um, Stephen's uh, mentioned about Steve Cooper over Wilder and what um, Baz had said in the latter, um, my thoughts were that as well, that um, I think with Wilder, with his how he finished at Sheffield United, it seemed to be a bit short term. Whereas uh, Cooper's, um, you can see that you can, you can be um, have Steve Cooper as like a project moving forward, and you can have him here for a few years because obviously his track record of developing players um, will be really key for us, um, especially with our academy. Okay, I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, thinking ahead to the transfer window. Now, my first hypothesis for you Stephen would it be a disaster all other things being equal in the division but would it be a disaster if we came out of the transfer window with a squad that's broadly the same as what we're going in with wouldn't be a disaster I think it would well it would allow us to carry on the work that Steve Cooper's doing with this squad now and and take them on but the there are gaps in the squad as we know that you're looking particular we've got on loan fullbacks who their parent clubs might want to recall them and then if that happens we're suddenly a bit short on numbers again um we've only got one real left back or left wing back if you like of of standard which is max low if he was to be recalled or if he was to be injured again then it's suddenly we're down to guy tambong who just cannot seem to to get himself to a level required for this team. So those are areas straight off the bat where we we would need to, I think, bring some reinforcements in and if possible, try to fill those positions permanently. And then that's before you've even got on to strikers. Lewis Grab and Lyle Taylor, perfectly fine, but another younger option coming in to push those two and potentially look to take the, the striking mantle long term. That those are areas that I think we would look to be targeting in January. Those little bits of extra quality that that turn you from playoff maybes into playoff contenders and just getting you over that line to, to where you want to be. Tom, I did a poll on Twitter and 45% said they'd like to strengthen at fullback and 52% said they want a new forward. Now, there are also rumours going around that... Uh, we're going to be weakened in the forward areas because Zande Silva's apparently on his way to Aristotle Thessaloniki. Um, what do you think? I just think um, he was one of those where, because the rumours were um, back in the summer was getting Josh Madger, but he failed his medical due to a, a underlying back issue. And having, say, we spent a few million on him and it come back that he was always injured, then obviously... And there would be pelters towards the club. Then Xander Silva's come in, and for whatever reason, he's not made many match, um, match day squads. Um, so uh, he's not going to be a loss, is he? Let's uh, let's be honest. Well, but just t- tell us about his contribution in a red shirt so far. Uh, got the ball, had a shot, went out for a throw in. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> so okay, uh, so, so so that leads me to Baz. Um, do you think we need another forward? I think uh, actually the, the key thing, oh, we've got no depth in the squad whatsoever. Um, the fact that we're playing Yates at centre half. I so, thought that so, was your dream. It is, but it's also it's, it's showing that we don't have a backup centre half when we're playing a back three because Mbe so injured. Um, and Rodrigo Ely. Yeah. Injured knows. again. Yeah. So so there's no depth in it whatsoever. And yeah, if we come out of this this transfer window with with no changes, that's okay. But it's the same as it's been for three years. It, all it takes is one kick to Lewis Graben's ankle and we're screwed. The rumours okay. about having the um, the Arsenal youngster, is it Balogun? And, uh, Doesn't think, everyone want him? Yeah, but I think with Forrest how the, um, with the lone players and youngsters, I think uh, may put Forrest in one of the box seats for that because of their track record with youngsters and loans. So, um, and where we are in the league... It might uh, might put us um, like top of the list. Fingers crossed. 
Mm. It's the and, Cooper influence as well, isn't it? That yeah. reputation he's got of developing youngsters. And at Swansea, he had Conor Gallagher and Rian Brewster in that that team that made the playoffs in his first season there. So if there are those kind of quality young players breaking through who need a bit of game time and are willing to drop down into a championship side, then I think having Cooper at, as manager really does give us a, an advantage there. And on that one, Stephen, it's Rian Brewston. That's that's got to be just paper talk, hasn't it? Because now he's on Premier League wages. He only just cost £24 million or something like that. That's not a realistic signing on loan for a second choice striker, is it? I wouldn't say so, no, unless he's absolutely desperate to play football and he's willing to take pay cuts in order to do it or Sheffield United are desperate to get him off the books. I don't see... I can't really see Sheffield United on. paying most of the wages for one of their players to go to a ch- championship rival. So yeah. I'm not sure there's much in that. And and Tom, uh, the other one that's been talked about in the papers a lot is Jay Fulton, who since Cooper left Swansea, he hasn't been able to get a kick of the ball, but he doesn't fit the age profile. And I'm just thinking actually central midfield, that, that sort of descent, defensive central midfielder position is probably the position where we're all right, isn't it? Um, yeah, you would say so, but um, it's like if we keep if Max Lowe isn't fit anytime soon, and then obviously Colbeck has to play, then then obviously we're a player missing in there, and you've got um, Yates who's had to play at centre half because uh, of Figueroa's absence, and you've only got leaves you with uh, Garner um, in there with um, Ajeda, so. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's one of those where, we, uh, as Baz has mentioned, we do need some more depth in the squad because um, any injuries and it's going to really uh, cock us up, really. So we just need to get some... Um, you don't need to like have a massive overhaul of the squad, just need like some quality additions just to uh, put us there or thereabouts if the club actually b- do believe, in which I believe they do think that um, promotions could be, um, could be um, one of those um, hopes for uh, the remaining months of the season. OK, and um, I guess the other thing that could be pivotal if Fulton is, is a genuine interest is that could give, let's say it's a short term deal, it could give Tyrese Fauna the chance to go out on loan, having just signed his new contract and so on. So that that's positive. Um, Baz, the elephant in the room that everyone keeps talking about, mainly because he keeps scoring and creating goals, is Brennan Johnson in his contract situation. I mean... I, well, I say that's the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is Brennan Johnson's agent is David Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I think that probably works in our favour now. Maybe it didn't six months ago <laughs> because mm. David Johnson obviously loves the club and he can see that the place the place for Brennan to develop is at the club. Um, I, I would say under, and we'll keep going back to Chris Hewton, but under Chris Hewton, I don't think... Brennan Johnson was quite the same player as he is under Steve Cooper. Um, and that's probably because Steve Cooper is very good at bringing through young players. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's a good place for him to be. It's whether it, if, yeah, maybe he gets some, um, the massive offer that no one can turn down and then, well, yeah, then we're, we're like that. But I can see it's in the club's interest to keep him. And I'd see that it's probably in Brennan Johnson's interest to stay here. So that, that's, that works in our favour. Okay, right, we'll round it off there and we're going to take a short break, but never fear because we'll leave you with this. The 1865 Sketch by Jeremy Davis. If a manager's body language truly reflects the style of his team, then Steve Cooper's performance in his pitch side interview with Forest TV after the Swansea match was such a faithful interpretation of the team's display on the day he could have dressed up as one of those Parisian mime artists and acted it out and we probably all still have got the gist. Cooper spends most of the first half of the interview with arms tightly folded across his chest, occasionally jabbing a finger towards the camera, a classically defensive pose that could be translated as keep it tight, soak up pressure, and hit them on the break, before becoming more expansive in the second half, at one point flinging his arm out wide right before bringing it back into the centre, a perfect simile for the movement of the ball for Lewis Graben's second goal. If Cooper's energy and enthusiasm reflects the way his Forest team plays, former manager Chris Hewton's tendency for sticking his finger in his ear and waggling it about during interviews suggested a team suffering from a vague and unpleasant feeling of discomfort that it was powerless to do anything about. 
Again, not a bad analogy for the team's performances at the start of the season. In previous years, of course, we had Sabri, whose Gallic intensity and reluctance to crack a smile could be said to have reflected the team's cautious approach during his tenure. Extrapolating beyond Forrest, there are few better examples of body language reflecting a team's style than Jose Mourinho, whose teams have become increasingly surly, miserable and passive-aggressive since his early days at Chelsea. And coming back to the subject of enigmatic French former Forest managers, Matt Mills has been on the Under the Cosh podcast complaining about cheese-loving ex-Forest boss Philippe Montagnier. Apparently there just wasn't enough intensity, hard work or emphasis on fitness, exemplified by the fact that they never did the bleep test, so-called thanks to generations of secondary school kids who have given it its full name, not the <laughs> test, in PE lessons over the years. At a time of year that is more about bells than bleeps, over at Derby, Wayne Rooney has dropped a clangor by getting into a ding-dong with some bell ringers. He may not be in favour of parking the bus like Jose, but he did park his Land Rover illegally on a night out near his home, incurring the wrath of some bell ringers who had the space reserved, and proceeded to school some decidedly un christmasy graffiti on the vehicle, including a cock and balls. It remains to be seen whether Rooney will face any sanction from the police, or at least penalty points on his license. But I suppose in Derby's current predicament, you'll take three points wherever you can get them. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and wishing you a very Merry Christmas. Now, it's just time for a quick update. We've not mentioned them for a little while, but FanHub, who we partner with, I know we keep banging on about our team predictions and so on and so forth, but it's because we really believe in FanHub. Uh, For those of you who don't know, FanHub is a campaign to get fans being put at the forefront of the game. We're the people who put in the money. So the aim of the game is to try and make sure that fans can get rewards. And FanHub has gone in less than a year from having no people subscribe to the app to having over 20,000 fans. And there are hundreds of Forest fans in there. So if you want to join the community, keep an eye on our social media, join in with the team predictions. And now you can get rewards as well. So even when you check in at a match, you may be eligible to get a reward. If you uh, get enough points, they can translate into fan shares and they occasionally give away match tickets and and, and shirts and, and, and merch, basically. So you can get rewards basically for doing your bit as a fan. And in the current fan hub, uh, league table of forest supporters well it's joel w russell who is in first place with 87 points followed by ng2 nffc 1865 well done because you are doing very well in the fan hub leaderboard and then jack smith 981 is in third place and overall forest are uh, 12th in the club leaderboard so forest fans are doing very well with their predictions and getting those rewards for checking in on match day viewing news items and so on and also you can listen to this particular podcast via fan hub if you would like so do subscribe we will be putting out golden tickets which are your way of jumping the queue and getting involved but let's move on because this section is all about you, the fans, and we would like to have another giveaway. Now, as you're aware, we are also sponsored by The Terrace, who are an official licensed merchandise provider for Forest. And we've got some mugs to give away, some Forest mugs, either in the home or away colours. And we've got three of those to give away. I'm, I'm springing this upon the rest of the guys. Um, I recently have been reading the Talking Reds book. And we had an interview with Keith, who was the author of the Talking Reds book last year. And uh, Keith interviewed various players who played for Forest in the 90s and noughties, um, including Ian Wone, Brian Roy, Des Little and so on. So I'm just going to quickly go around and ask you, Tom, first of all, if you had to name a memorable player from, you know, from your youth, from the 90s and noughties, who would it be? Um, Stan Collymore. It's done quite, okay, that's a, that's that's a bit of a no brainer, isn't it, Stephen? What about you? For me, Steve Stone, mm-hmm. tricky okay. winger, England international, played at Euro '96. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's easy to forget how many England caps he got, and in big matches as well. What about you, Baz? Um, I mean, Stan Collin was the obvious one um, from that '90s team. I, I've always got a thing for Lars Bohinen, mm. scoring straight from corners. 
Yeah. And, and what's interesting about about reading this book is that you hear you get some some interesting facts that I don't think have, have been around. So I didn't really realise this. I assume that all Dutch people spoke really good English. But Brian Roy, apparently, he learnt English at school, but he never really spoke it that much until he until he moved to Forest. Um, might explain why he thought it was in London. And um, also the other interesting fact there is that he basically acted as translator for Andreas Salenzi because Salenzi didn't speak any English. And of course, Brian Roy played in Italy, so he was able to act as a bit of a translator. One of the other facts, we all know that um, Ian Wone was signed from, from Runcorn, but did you know that he was still working as a quantity surveyor when he signed for Forest? So there's some really interesting bits and pieces. So look, Talking Reds is just one book that is out there. Um, there's other good um, reads that are out there. Um, I mean, just again, to put you all on the spot, have you got any particular favourites in terms of uh, a bit of forest nostalgia there, Tom, or any forest-based books? Um, one of my favourite books is Duncan Hamilton's Provide You Don't uh, Kiss Me. Uh, I think it was something like 15 years working with, well, alongside Brian Clough when he was at the Evening Post, so that's a, a good read. And um, yeah, I've read it a few times now. It's one of those books where you uh, you want to go back and read it again i have to say as well um um, i might have had some dust in my eye when it got to the bit where where he heard about brian's passing it was it was quite a tough read that page so um uh stephen what about you i believe in miracles by danny taylor the book which accompanies johnny owen's film tells the story of the the incredible rise of that incredible forest team the the transformation from a second division outfit into European champions twice. It, it just explores those little extra depths that perhaps the film couldn't, and it's well worth a well worth a read. And Baz? Um Stuart Pierce's autobiography, but my favourite bit in it isn't actually about forests. It's about when he went to West Ham and he said the culture there was, again, culture, was um, basically it was complete and utter chaos to the point where he could go out on the match day and not be able to find his boots. So he'd have to go into someone else's locker, take their boots and wear them for the game because someone had stolen his. And I just, I just loved the idea of that, that level of chaos. <laughs> um, I think I would probably choose... Out of the you know the ones that you mentioned are all are all good reads. I'd probably go for Brian Clough's second autobiography, uh, Walking on Water, which he wrote after he retired. Um, it was not that long before he passed away, actually. And so I think that kind of that hindsight enabled him to think back and about some of the things that that went wrong and 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 look over things with a slightly sl- a slight degree of detachment. So uh, again, quite quite a tough read in places, but but very much worth it. So. With regard to our giveaway, I say we've got three forest mugs to give away. All we want you to do is to email forestramble at gmail.com and tell us what was Ian Wone's job before he became a professional footballer when he signed for Forest. So what did Ian Wone do professionally before he became a full time footballer? So email forestramble at gmail.com. We know it's the Christmas period, so it may take you a little while to get around to listening to this. So we're going to set a deadline of 8 p.m. on the 27th of December. And we will have a look at the entries we've got there and select three lucky winners to get a mug and maybe even a little bonus as well, if we can manage that. So sorry, it won't get to you in time for Christmas, but it might make a nice little gift to see in the new year. Anyway, let's move on from there. And I just want to also talk about, I mentioned earlier, I did some Twitter polls, which were thinking about um, the transfer market. But also I asked um, you as fans on Twitter to rate Steve Cooper from one to five, where one is awful and five is exceptional. 19% of you went for four out of five. 81% of you went for five out of five. None of you thought he was average or worse. And that's, I think, speaks volumes. Then I also asked um, Joao Carvalho. Now, I gave you the options for and 22 percent of you were feeling that 24 percent of you went. No, thanks. And half of you, well, 54 percent said meh. Um, Tom, what are your thoughts on Joao Carvalho? A bit meh, to be honest. Um, I mean, he, he come with a huge promise with the price tag and he's worked under, what, three or four managers now and they've not been 
hundred percent convinced with him and he come on yesterday and he didn't do a lot wrong, but he didn't do much to influence the game. And I think it's getting to the point where he's getting towards a crossroads in his forest career. And I don't think he's going to be here much longer because we're just not getting uh, value for money out of him. And I think, I mean, yesterday, I think it was more that Steve Cooper's hand was forced because Mighton went off um, because he hasn't. That was the first bit of football he's played under Steve Cooper. And it's just a matter of that. I, I think he's coming to his time at Forest. And I mean, I, I loved him when he, you know, when he first came, I thought, oh, we could have a really good player on our hands here. But apart from that uh, early promise under Aitor Karanka, he hasn't done a lot for me as a, at Forest. And then he went on loan. Was it last season or the season before? So I just think we we haven't got value for money out of him. OK, I'm not going to come to Baz on this because Baz and I feel the same way, which is, as Baz succinctly put it about a year ago, I have feelings for Jacques Carvalho. So, uh, but we'll come to you, Stephen. What do you think? I really wanted to work out for him the, the quality that he's got. And we've seen flashes of it with incredible passes and assists direct free kicks that he scored, the trickery and the skill he has. I, I do really want it to work out for him, but as Tom's alluded to, it's three or four managers now who've 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 had him and decided he's not not offering enough to the team or he won't offer enough to the team and he's not being given the opportunities. So it probably suits everybody that he moves on and hopefully he can kickstart his career somewhere else. But it would be a shame because despite things not working out for him on the pitch, he's a, he's a likeable guy and he's got the potential to to light up games. And yeah, I'd still really like to see that happen in a Forest shirt. OK, Baz, um, look, you're not allowed to mention the TikTok video of him dancing with the dog. <laughs> no, actually, what I wanted to say was I read a couple of weeks, no, a couple of months ago, when Cristiano Ronaldo went to Manchester United, there was an article somewhere or the other that I read, which was basically how do you how do managers deal with like a superstar like that? And um, there was part of it where they were talking to Ito Karanka about um, how they did it at Real Madrid, and basically they said that the key with Cristiano Ronaldo is because he's a superstar, because he has this talent, that we built the entire facilities, everything around in the club was built around him, and everything was geared around him and what he needed and what he wanted. And then when, as soon as I read that, I suddenly thought, that's why I talk Aranka bought Jao Carvalho. He wanted a superstar player who's got more talent than anyone else. And he was going to build the entire club around him and no one else. None of the other managers are prepared to build their club around one player, especially one player who hasn't got the work rate. And so that's why he's not cutting it at our club he's 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 that kind of player he needs everything to be put, put into his favor so that 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 two seconds where he lights things up and changes stuff and does things that no one else can do can happen mm. I would also just add in there that it, talking about that loan and this is me editorializing for which I make no apology um, talking about that loan, what that was is symptomatic of the way that Forrest were treating a lot of players at the time. Nuno da Costa has alluded to it in an interview on his current loan, which is that Forrest sometimes have not treated players very well at all. They've not treated them like human beings. And so I think it's a real shame that a player with huge promise like Carvalho, but so much of his career has ended up kind of being lost in that morass of the club putting thing putting other things ahead of player welfare particularly during the pandemic but that's my opinion and other opinions are available now going back to the polls um one of the questions uh was to do with we've got a situation at the moment where we're all on tenter hooks we're recording this uh, about five days before christmas and we've got a situation where we don't actually know what what's going to happen in the country uh we're one, waiting to see if the Prime Minister will announce more lockdown measures. Obviously, there's matches getting called off everywhere. We're being told to uh, take, you know, precautionary measures with regards to social distancing and masks and so on. So I asked, would you prefer a two to three uh, week winter break or would you prefer matches behind closed doors? And 80 percent said we'd prefer a circuit breaker and 20 percent said, actually, let's go for empty stadiums. Now, I don't want to spend too long on this one. 
Um, my opinion is I would like a circuit breaker if it was proven it would make any difference because it would mean fans not going to matches. It would mean the players having that break whereby they're less likely to transmit to each other, which has happened at a lot of clubs. Um, but obviously, financially, it could be pretty damaging for clubs. Um, Tom, very briefly. Um, I think it's to see what the data suggests uh, with the relevant, um, relevant parties um, with the government and everything it be hugely um, disappointing if that did happen because unfortunately I think COVID's here to stay and it's just a matter of like working with it with the boosters and things like that so it'd be a massive disappointment if we do go to either a circuit breaker which probably looking at it probably be the best option but going back to empty stadiums I mean as everybody's alluded to it in the um, media and uh, beyond that uh, football without fans was absolutely awful, wasn't it? So hopefully we don't go down that route, but um, if it's a circuit breaker to obviously prevent um, infections and uh, deaths, then it might have to be one of those where we've just got to go with it, unfortunately. But I think we've all enjoyed going back to the football. And the last time we had like a a lockdown, excuse me, He's getting choked up. You're breaking up there, Tom. Yeah, yeah. It's an emotional moment. (laughs) No, I'm all right now. I've just had a um, a biscuit. So, Um, but no, I think it's um, when we last time I had a lockdown. It was, it was awful, wasn't it? Yeah, Um, and and hopefully, you know, it's good to know you're getting to enjoy that biscuit again. Um, Baz, what do you think? Um, Well, I I think the 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 key thing with a circuit breaker is it will give us fans some certainty because. The thought of someone not only giving up their Boxing Day with their family to go to to Middlesbrough, but then finding out that it's been like um, called off like a few minutes beforehand, that that's out out of order. And well, I think it was fifteen games that pl- that were played yesterday. That's it's just not sustainable like that. So it's it doesn't matter about the players. It's it's for us that that, that we need a circuit breaker just to give us a bit of um, certainty in, in, in what's going on at the moment. Stephen? Yeah, I agree with Baz. I think a circuit breaker for two or three weeks, just to just to let everybody know where we stand and hopefully allow the opportunity for things to calm down a bit and then see where we are in January and with a view to, to opening up again. OK, I'd just also like to add in there that the ludicrous situation whereby um, Leeds versus Arsenal was literally the match of the day in the Premier League. And Leeds, I think, had seven fit first teamers and they weren't allowed to call a match off because they were injuries rather than COVID. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, there's that's Leeds choice to have a small squad. That's the way they'll be able to play things. But there's, there's something that doesn't quite sit right there. But the, the, the thing with that, the thing about the Leeds thing is... Leeds are, I think they've got one player who hasn't been vaccinated. So the clubs that are calling stuff off have got lots of players that haven't been vaccinated. They're getting ill they're getting the game's called off. Leeds effectively done the right thing and, and they're, they're, they're getting punished for it. Um, and we're going to move on from there uh, because we're getting into political territory and that's not necessarily what we're here for. But I do want to, uh, the last question in the poll was a non-footballing question which is, what's your favourite bit of Christmas dinner? So the contenders were turkey, pigs in blankets, roast potatoes and chocolate orange. And uh, Tom, which is which of those would you choose? Uh, pigs in blanket all day. Baz? Pigs in blanket, but I will say that cranberry sauce is the greatest thing to ever come out of America. Oh, wow. OK, that's we're getting political again. OK, Stephen. Pigs in blankets, everybody said, and they are great. So I'm going to say roast potatoes because they deserve recognition. Yeah, I'm I'm all for the roast potatoes. And um, it's, it always makes me laugh every time you see the, the TV cookery shows. Oh, here's what to do with your Christmas leftovers. And they're using potatoes. Like, there's no such thing as a leftover roast potato after Christmas dinner. That's that's that keeps me going for the rest of the day. Um, so 14 percent went turkey, 45 said pigs, pigs in blankets and um Roast potatoes got only 34% of it, with chocolate orange getting 7%. Um, I mean, let's be honest, it's not Christmas dinner, it's Christmas breakfast, isn't it, the chocolate orange? So, um, all right. And with that, we move on and we go to a game of Guess That Red. 1865, Guess That Red. 
This is our game. Guess that red. If you haven't heard this before, this is uh, where we get asked some questions and asked to name a mystery forest player. And this month, it's Stephen's turn to be the quiz master. So, uh, Stephen, you've got five questions for us. We're going to shout out our names if we know the answer and see if we can guess that red. Okay, and your first clue is... This player was born in Middlesbrough on March the 4th, 1976. Not a clue? Okay. This player began his career at Darlington. Too far. Okay, this one. Oh, Colin Cooper. It's not Colin Cooper. He's way older than that. Your third clue. This player signed for Forest under the management of David Platt. Silence is not a good sound on a podcast, is it? <laughs> I've wiped most of those players out of my mind. (laughs) Your fourth clue. Either side of his time with Forest, this player had spells in the Premier League with Bradford City, Birmingham City, Burnley and Bolton Wanderers. Um, Robbie Blake. It is Robbie Blake. Ah, well done. I didn't know he was from Darlington, uh, from, uh, well, the North East. Well done, Tommy. I didn't know that. I thought he was more Bradford than I thought. Well, then well, he played for Bradford. We saw, didn't we sign him on loan from Bradford or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Played for Leeds as well. So you you do think he's got that Yorkshire connection rather than kind of kind of the North East and Darlington? But my final clue was going to be he scored one goal in twelve appearances for Forest. That was against Barnsley. And then if there was a still a struggle, I was going to put forward that. Rumours were Forrest did want to sign him, but Nigel Dowsey said that we didn't have the money to. And Baz and I were at that Barnsley away match, weren't we? Um, I don't know if you remember that one at all. Yeah, I do, actually. Yeah. Just about. Mm, yeah, so, um, OK, well, thank you very much, Steve. Now, well, you almost had a stump there. And that more or less brings us to the end of this festive edition of... 1865 the nottingham forest podcast so all that remains is for me to say a big thank you to stephen Topless, to tom newton to baz we say thank you to jeremy davis for the sketch we also send our best wishes to the married on the midlands who's recovering from a bout of covid um and we say finally thank you to producer romeo and thank you to you listener for joining us all the way through this season so far um it started badly but it's really looking up so we wish you a merry christmas and here's hoping for a really successful and healthy new year Thank you very much, Jeremy. <laughs> I just going to say, it's like I've got some dust in me. I have just having a biscuit. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs>